Chapter 14, Driven Nearly to Madness The boys sat on hard benches, shivering in their mismatched shorts and cotton jerseys. The sun had already set, and the shell house was drafty and uncomfortable. Outside, it was a bitterly cold night. The panes of glass on the great sliding doors were frosted at the corners. It was the evening of January 14, 1935, the first crew turnout of the new year. Tensions in the shell house had run high during the fall season, as the continuing rumors that the sophomores might be pegged for the first varsity boat had everyone on edge. There was little of the usual banter and joshing. Icy stares began to replace good-natured grins. Now the boys were waiting for Al Ulbrichsen to lay out his plan for the upcoming racing season. After a long, uncomfortable wait, Ulbrichsen emerged from his office and began to talk. By the time he finished, nobody in the room was cold any longer. He had started off simply announcing a change of basic strategy. They were not going to take it slow for the first few weeks of winter quarter, as they generally did, working on details of form and technique while waiting for the weather to improve. Instead, they were going to row all out every day, right from the start. They were going to work themselves into top physical condition, and their races would be for the highest of stakes. This was not going to be an ordinary season. At one time or another, he declared, Washington crews have won the highest honors in America. They have not, however, participated in the Olympic Games. That's our objective. The push to go to Berlin in 1936 and to win gold there was to begin that night. Ulrichsen began to grow animated, almost emotional. There was more potential in this room, he said, than he had ever seen in a shell house in all his years of rowing and coaching, more than he had ever expected to see again in his lifetime. Somewhere among them, he told the boys, was the greatest crew that Washington had ever seen, maybe the best Washington would ever see. Nine of them, he ended up declaring, as if it were a certainty, were going to be standing on the metal podium in Berlin in 1936. It was up to each of them whether they would be there or not. When he finished, the boys leapt to their feet and cheered. The next morning, the Seattle Post Intelligencer exalted a new era in Washington rowing, possible entry in the Olympic Games in Berlin. All-out war promptly broke out in the shell house. The rivalries had arisen during the fall season now turned into outright battles. Accidental bumping of shoulders turned into open pushing matches. Locker doors were slammed. Curses were exchanged. Grudges were nursed. Two brothers in different boats now barely greeted each other with grunts each afternoon. The weather stalled Albrechtson's plans to have the boys row themselves into shape. A series of brutal winter storms roared in from the Gulf of Alaska. Bitter winds ripped the surface of Lake Washington into a furious tumble of white-capped waves. The temperatures dropped into the teens. Snow flurries turned into light snowstorms, which in turn became full-scale blizzards. When the boys did hit the water for quick sprints, they'd row in the snow until their hands grew so numb they could no longer hold the oars. In February, the boats began to compete head-to-head -to, -head to see which crew would be the first varsity squad. Joe remained in the all-sophomore boat. Another member of his crew, Bob Green, had begun to annoy some of the boys in the other boats. Green had the habit of getting excited and bellowing encouragement to his crewmates during races. Normally, only the coxswain shouts commands, and this breach of an unstated rowing rule irritated the older boys, particularly Bobby Mock, the savvy little coxswain of the best JV boat. Mock learned to turn Green's loudness to his advantage. Whenever his boat came up alongside Joe and the sophomores, Mock quietly leaned toward his stroke oar and told him to pick up the pace. Green, meanwhile, would be hooting and hollering at his own crew, urging them on. Mock would direct his megaphone over to the sophomore boat and say, Well, Green just opened his big mouth again. Let's pass them. By the time he said this, his own boat would already be starting to surge, since he'd secretly given the order to increase the pace. To the sophomore boat, though, it seemed like magic. The change appeared to be instant, as if Mock's crew could just blow past them any time they wanted. Green would start yelling even more loudly, more, more, give me ten big ones, but Mock's boat would already be accelerating away. Each time Mock tried the trick, the sophomores lost their cool. They flailed at their oars, angry and desperate to catch up. 
Time after time, they got, as Mock called it, all bloody-nosed, and none more so than Joe. The whole thing seemed like another joke at his expense, designed to show him up, but it always worked. Albrechtson was starting to have some serious doubts about the sophomores. He'd expected that by now they would emerge decisively as the new varsity lineup. But as he watched them struggle against the JV boys, they just didn't look like the crew that had won with such astonishing ease at Poughkeepsie. He studied them for a few days, trying to figure it out, looking for individual faults. Then he called Roger Morris, Shorty Hunt, Joe Rance, and two other boys into his office for a talk. He told them flat out that they were all in danger of falling out of contention for the first varsity boat if they didn't shape up. Among other things, they were letting their emotions climb into the boat with them. They were losing their cool over little things, and that had to stop. He reminded them that there were only eight seats for rowers in the first varsity boat, and that four or five boys were vying for each one. Then he stopped talking and simply pointed at the door. Joe, Roger, and Shorty came out of the shell house shaken, trying to ignore a cluster of seniors and juniors smirking at them from the doorway. They started up the hill in the rain. Talking over what had just happened, they were beginning to get agitated. Shorty Hunt had grown up in a small town. His family life had been stable, and as a result, he'd grown up confident and highly accomplished. In high school, he starred in three sports and excelled in the classroom, graduating two years early. He was talkative and good-looking, with wavy dark hair, and although he stood six foot three, his fellow students dubbed him Shorty. He liked to dress well and was forever drawing admiring glances from the young women around him. He and Roger had been buddies from day one, and Joe was grateful that the two of them had never given him a hard time about his music or his clothes. In fact, more and more, Joe could count on Shorty and Roger to come to his side. When the older boys teased him, or when Albrechtson singled him out for criticism, Shorty rode in the number two seat right behind Joe, and he'd taken lately to looping an arm over Joe's shoulder whenever he seemed down and saying, Don't worry, Joe, I've got your back. As they walked up the hill from the shell house that night, the three boys complained about Albrechtson. They were angry he chewed them out. Shorty, in particular, was agitated. Albrechtson was unfair, he complained. He was a cold taskmaster, too hard on him, too blind to see how they, hard they were working. He'd do better to give a fellow an occasional pat on the back than to always find fault. Roger moped along, looking even more morose than usual. They all knew Ulbrichson wasn't likely to change. They agreed that from now on, they'd all better be watching one another's backs. That night, Joe slept uneasily. Even at the crew house, the one place he'd begun to feel more or less at home, it was obvious that he still remained utterly disposable. The next day, the sophomore boat suddenly snapped back into form, handily beating all four of the other boats on its first outing. Over the next several weeks, the five potential varsity crews went at it tooth and nail, and through it all, the sophomores seemed to have found themselves again. Coach Ulbrichson finally decided to list them as the first varsity boat. The following day, they rode awkwardly and lost badly. That night, writing in his logbook, Ulbrichson tore them apart. Horrible, he wrote. Every man for himself. No semblance of teamwork. Have gone to sleep entirely. Albrechtson was beyond confused. He was starting to feel as if the sophomores might drive him nearly to madness. He had also begun to see a great deal of unexpected talent in some of his other boats. Coach Bowles was reporting that his top freshman crew was rowing nearly as fast as Joe and his crew had the year before. They seemed to be getting better each time out. There was a curly-haired kid in the freshman boat, Don Hume, who looked particularly promising. He wasn't polished yet, but he never seemed to tire, never showed pain. He just kept going, kept driving forward like a well-oiled locomotive. There was also a big, muscular, quiet boy named Gordy Adam in the number five seat and a kid named Johnny White in number two. White just lived and breathed rowing. The JV boat that Bobby Mock was steering also contained a couple of promising sophomores. These boys hadn't made Joe's boat the year before, but now they were looking strong. Jim Stubb McMillan was a six foot five beanpole of a kid. Stubb was big enough to provide the power that a great crew needs in the engine room, and he never seemed to believe he was beaten. Then there was a bespectacled boy named Chuck Day, a chatterbox and a prankster. Day was the sort who tended to fight first and ask questions later, but he was also always ready with a joke. As February gave way to March, Albrechtson abandoned the notion of set crews. He started mixing and matching boys in different boats. First, he moved Joe out of the sophomore boat. The boat slowed down. 
The next day, Joe was back in. Albrechtson moved Stub McMillan into the seven seat in the sophomore boat, then took him out the next day. He tried taking Joe out again with the same weak results. He moved Shorty Hunt into Mock's JV boat. Slowly, two favorites began to stand out. One was the original sophomore boat. The other was the JV boat with Mock, McMillan, and Day. Albrechtson was waiting for one of them to break through, but it just wasn't happening. There were plenty of technical faults in both boats, but that was not the real problem. Albrechtson had begun to notice that there were too many days when they rode not as a crew, but as boats full of individuals. The more he scolded them for their technical issues, the more the boys seemed to sink into their own separate and sometimes defiant little worlds. What they needed was to find something rowers call their swing, and they were not going to get there acting like individuals. Many crews never really find their swing. It only happens when all eight oarsmen row in such perfect unison that no single action by any one of them is out of sync with those of all the others. All at once, 16 arms must begin to pull together. 16 knees must begin to fold and unfold in unison. Eight bodies must begin to slide forward and backward. Eight backs must begin to bend and straighten. Each tiny action must be mirrored exactly by each oarsman. If they can find their swing, it allows the crew to conserve energy, to move through the water as efficiently as possible, and often more rapidly than another crew that appears to be working much harder. Joe and his crew had found their swing as freshmen the day they'd won in Poughkeepsie. Al Albrechtson had not forgotten that. He could not, in fact, get the picture out of his mind. There had been something marvelous, almost magical, about how they closed out that race. He had to believe they could find it again.